Gary covered today. <laughs> my wife and I, my wife is actually the one that uh, really has taken and always looked out for her, uh, our three sons. And actually today, he's not his son, but uh, she said, Gary needs to be taken care of. She, the boys are all moved out, so now she's looking out for others. <laughs> so we got him an umbrella. <laughs> for, for those guests here, there's a story behind this umbrella. Go back a few weeks and watch it on YouTube and you will see. But uh, Weather's thanks, coming. Emily. Weather's coming. Well, the weather is coming and we're trying to get boats secured. Pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for this time, this hour that we have to come to worship you, to hear your word, to be able to take what we have here today and, and hear the word that's uh, being preached to us, God, and take it out into the world to those who are in need and that are lost, that through our being able to hear this word and bring it out to them, they'll be able to come to you, Lord, and be able to have all the grace and all the things that you give to us in our hearts and our souls. We ask that you with Gary at this time as he preaches. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Christine. Y'all are expecting bad weather, lots of rain, and at least I'll have an umbrella, right? As I watch another boat sink. Yeah, we uh, didn't think the last storm was going to be as bad as it was. So it, we will see. <laughs> we, we will see. Um, it's good to see you today. Happy our guests are here uh, with us as, as, as well. Glad you've come to, to worship God. Um, need to make an announcement here. We still need volunteers for Children's Church. And uh, little, there's like three ways you can, you can sign up for that. One is we have a sign-up sheet in the back in the fellowship hall. You can go online and sign up, or you can get with Tiffany and say, hey, I want to be in there with the children uh, for Children's Church. And they will get you signed up. You know, I, and I've, I've, I've kind of harped on this because we really need some people to sign up for that. And so I got to thinking about it. And I said, you know what? I, you know, being naturally bright like I am, I figured this out. I said, people don't want to miss my sermons. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do for the next three months. They will be the most boring sermons <laughs> you have ever heard. And so you might as well go back there with the children, because that will be much more exciting, right? Amen? Amen. Okay. So please sign up. We, we need you to sign up uh, for, for Children's Church and, and be a part of that, that ministry. Our children need us uh, back there helping out. So as Todd mentioned, we have been studying in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and 23, the uh, fruit of the Spirit. And... Uh, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. The NIV says forbearance. We also know it as patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we talked about kindness last week. This week, this week we're going to be talking about goodness. Now, being good, being good, right? I mean, just... Think about that. Just be good. Brother R.A. Baker, I had to run this by Lynn Henley. I think it was R.A. Baker uh, when he was dean of students at uh, Faulkner University. Back then, it was Alabama Christian College. When he was dean of students, he uh, one time told the students upon orientation, when he had them all in the rotunda, he said, this is my rule. Be good. Didn't E.T. say that as well? Okay. Be good. Y'all remember the movie E.T.? Didn't E.T. say that? Okay, I just thought of that while I was up here. So <laughs> I said, that sounds like E.T. Uh, a lot of our folks don't know who E.T. is, but he, he said, be good. So today, today we're going to be looking at that a, a little bit. So I, I want to start with, with basically this. What determines the value of something. What determines the value of something? If you handed a child a $100 bill or a Reese's candy bar, 
or some other treat that they liked, and they were little and they looked at it, more than likely they will take the candy bar rather than the $100 bill. Because to them, the value is there in the candy bar, not the $100 bill. They don't understand necessarily the value of the $100 bill. You know, so what determines the value of something? You know, we all have things that we consider valuable. Getting ready for a storm, we want to make sure we have stuff ready to go, right? We want to make sure our, our photos, we want to uh, take our photos, right? And, and other documents and things that we might have, you know, because it's valuable to us. Uh, let's, say, let's say you had a boat. And, and you didn't want that boat to sink in this storm. You know, you're going to take action to secure that boat. Visitors, that's another story for you. Go back a few months to that one as well, and you'll understand what I'm talking about, a boat. But uh, some things are valuable to us. How do we determine that value? Well, during the past few weeks, we've looked here at Galatians 5, and 23, and we've considered the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about some very valuable fruits, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, all of those things. And then we come down here to goodness. I sometimes don't think that people are as committed to the idea of goodness anymore. You know, while, while, while love and joy and peace and patience, these all step up to the plate and, 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 and they hit a grand slam. You know, goodness just kind of does its best to Maybe get a single. To many, goodness is just not considered important or even that desirable today. One of our problems with goodness is the same one we have with love. The word good is used in so many ways, just like we use the word love. You know, we love our children, we love apple pie, we love a, a sunset, we, 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 you know, all of these loves are different. Kind of the same way with the word good. We say, you know, I had a good meal, or I met a good person, or, 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 or so-and-so had a good cry. You know, they're all different when we use them that way. And so it's a little harder to, to nail it down. But we're going to look this morning at how the word good is used in the Bible. Basically, we're going to scratch the surface a little bit. In opening chapters of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. He created life in the sea and in the air and on the ground. And after everything, God looked at it and said, it is good. It is good. You know, what does that mean? What does that mean it's good? I guess it means when God looked at it and, and, and what he'd done, he was pleased. And maybe we should say that goodness means something that pleases God. Or maybe we could go a step further and say, you know, a good person is a person who's pleasing to God. The Bible also tells us that God is good. Well, what makes God good? Well, you know, he's pure, he's holy, he's forgiving, he's generous. So, therefore, if we're good people, then maybe those characteristics would be for us as well, right? Sure. Sometimes people tell me goodbye. They say, all right, now, be good. Be good. You know, in the profession that I am in, it's, you know, it's imperative that I'm good as your preacher, right? Right? Yeah. You want your preacher to be good, right? Yes. I am, I am paid by the elders to be good, while all of you can be good for nothing. <laughs> okay. I've waited years to use that. 
I'm going to have to rewatch me on the video later. <laughs> but going on further than that, let me give you another definition of goodness. It, it, pretty simple. If you'll remember this, I think you'll begin to see the value of goodness. Goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. You know, I guess we could do the right thing for the wrong reason. I, I guess that we could even do the wrong thing for the right reason. But goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. Jesus, definitely a demonstration for us of goodness. We've been reminded again and again over the past several weeks, talking about these fruits of the Spirit, uh, that our model, our example is Jesus Christ. When you want perfect love, look at Jesus. When you want joy and peace, look at Him. You know, patience, all of these things, look, look to Jesus. And I don't necessarily want to make the mistake of thinking that being good came naturally for Jesus. He came in the flesh. He came in the flesh to, to live as we do. And Satan tempted him over and over again. Turn with me to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We're going to see three temptations here uh, of Jesus. First, the temptation of selfishness. Second, the temptation of compromise. And third one's the temptation of popularity. And Satan's going to use these same temptations on us even today that he was using on Christ back then. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it's, not, it's written, man does not live on bread alone. Now here's this age-old struggle between selfishness and love. It started in the Garden of Eden. It continues today. Today's culture tells us, you know, as long as we got food and nice clothes and we live in a nice house and we drive a nice car and we're able to live in comfort and we're at success, we ought to be proud of ourselves. Yeah. I've arrived. I hear a radio advertisement on some jewelry store here in town. And God bless you if you're the owners of it. I don't mean any slight to you, but the, 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 it, it goes something like this. You know, you, you buy our jewelry because you need to let people know you've arrived. You have arrived. <laughs> yeah. So, here Satan is, kind of letting Jesus know, you know, let people know you've arrived. Trying to get Jesus' focus on himself. He tempts Jesus, turns the sto uh, stones into bread. You know, Satan tends to tempt us in our areas of weakness, and Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. I'm sure he was extremely hungry. It would have been so easy for him to have used his power, do what Satan suggested. Satan comes there and starts talking about, turn, turn this stone into bread. Now, if I'd have been Jesus, um, bread, okay, that might not have, you know, if he just said turn it to fried chicken, I might say, well, you, maybe you got something there. I don't know if you've ever been really hungry. Uh, I have, and... It was brought on by the United States Air Force, a um, school that a lot of us went to, uh, Sears School, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, Escape. It was a school, and is a school, Fairchild Air Force Base up in Washington State on the uh, eastern side of the state. And I tell you what, um, you're out in the woods for like seven days, and and I remember it just like it happened yesterday. And this was back in 1990. And, and, and we got off that bus up there and it was raining on us. And it rained for the first three days. And it rained and it rained and it rained and it rained on us for three days. It's like, you know, let's just cut this short going back in. I'm cold and I'm hungry and I am wet. Let's go home. But they said no. And finally, the third day, it stopped raining as it started snowing. And then it snowed on us for the rest of the time there. And we were hungry because we were supposed to live off the land. 
Yeah. I remember that. And so, like, we didn't eat anything. I mean, it was like seven days. And uh, yeah, I was so hungry. I can imagine Jesus there 40 days. Surely he was pretty hungry at 40 days. I was pretty hungry. We got out of the woods on that Sunday afternoon after seven days of being out there in the wilderness. Uh, we all went, showered, and went to the chow hall. And I went through that chow hall. And you talk about on my, I, man, I was putting everything I could on that. And we got down there and sat down to eat. And you know what happens after seven days of not eating? Your stomach shrinks. And I had all that beautiful food, and I was still trying to eat it. And then I was sick from eating so much after, after my hunger strike. Didn't mean to get off so much on that. It's just bringing back some memories and, you know, thinking about, boy, you know, Jesus must have been pretty hungry. And here Satan is saying, hey, you know what? I know you're ready to eat. Here you go. Turn this stone into bread. You can do it. If he could just possibly get Jesus to be concerned about his own self, about satisfying his own needs, of making things easy for himself, taking the easy way out, then Jesus would never be willing to pray where he says, not my will, but thine be done. And he certainly would not have been willing to pay the price for our sins. He wouldn't have gone to the cross for us. If he was so concerned about his own needs, he never would have gotten around to being concerned for us. But Jesus, because he came to do the will of his Father, knew that the most important thing wasn't himself, but it was us. And he says, so it is written, man does not live on bread alone. Jesus did the right thing for the right reason. Now, the second temptation was a temptation to compromise here. In Luke 4, 5 through 7, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it's going to be all yours. I can give you everything. Worship me. I can give you everything. You know, people line up by the thousands to buy lottery tickets to hit it big so they can get what they want. They can get everything. Everything. We want the new house and the new car and exotic vacations and doing all these things we couldn't do otherwise. We want to hit it big. Give us everything. There's nothing wrong with material things. God gave them to us. But you, I've got to understand also that God is the true owner of everything that we have anyway. He owns it. He loans it to us. Jesus did the right thing. Verse 8. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Once again, Jesus did the right thing, and he did it for the right reason. Third temptation here is the, is the temptation of popularity. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So, the devil here is saying, it is written. Is that true? It is, it is true. It is written. What the devil said was correct. Is it taken out of context? Well, yeah, a lot. You see... At this point, Jesus and the devil get into a little theological debate and they start quoting the Bible. It's pretty good. Read that when you have a chance. Read it further. So he does. He tries taking a little scripture out of context. He's tempting Jesus to do something spectacular. Amaze the crowd. Show them your power. Show them your power. If Jesus would do something marvelous, like throwing himself down from the top of the temple in Jerusalem, 
that everyone would eagerly follow him. And you know, if he'd do it again every once in a while, people would come far and near to see it and praise him, and he would instantly become the most popular man in all of Israel. That was the temptation that Jesus, or excuse me, that Satan brought to Jesus. And it wasn't last time. He did it again as Jesus hung on the cross. Listen to the people crying out. They said, Jesus, if you're really the Messiah, come down from the cross and save yourself. Then we'll believe in you. Show us you're really the Son of God. We'll follow you. What a big temptation that must have been because, you know, Jesus could have done that. He could have saved himself. He could have saved himself, but he wouldn't have saved us. Hmm. Jesus said to Satan, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And in verse 13, it goes on to say, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. You know, Satan didn't stay away long. He just kept on coming back. But Jesus deliberately did the right things for the right reasons. You know, there are tangible ways that we can display goodness. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about a good tree and a bad tree. He says that a good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree, uh, well, it doesn't produce good fruit. Matthew 7, 17 through 20, and he says the good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and the bad tree cannot produce good fruit. If the good tree does not produce good fruit, we cut it down and throw it into the fire. And he ends it by saying, by their fruit, by their fruit, you're going to recognize them. By their fruit. So the question is, what kind of fruit are we producing? And when you look at this fruit, do you see goodness? Four ways I have here of displaying goodness. First is, we can display God's goodness by being forgiving. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. First step to do the right thing for the right reason and to become, and to become uh, forgiving as God is forgiving. Forgive people. Be good. And part of being good is forgiving. Maybe we don't want to be good, right? Some things are hard to forgive. Somebody cutting you off in traffic, you'll get over that in a little bit. But there's a lot deeper and heavier things that forgiveness at that point can become a process, a journey. Being good means forgiving. Second step is purity. We can display goodness by being morally pure. By being morally pure. Do you have good morals? Are you morally pure? You know, our, our culture, our culture really doesn't embrace being morally pure. It really doesn't. Our culture tells us things like, you know what, everybody else is doing this. It's okay to do this. It's, you know, everybody cheats on their taxes a little bit. Everybody claims some things that, well, it's not really, I mean, everybody else is doing it, why not me? Last year, when my boat sank in Hurricane Sally, we had to fill out paperwork. And insurance company said, you know, we'll pay up to $1,000 for valuables that you had in your boat. Well, great. So we had valuables in the boat. I had tools that I always carry with me in my boat. Now, they don't cover things like life jackets because that's supposed to be in the boat. 
even though you got some nice ski jackets, they don't cover that, as I have learned. And other things that they don't cover, but they will cover things that you might have purchased and put into your boat. Maybe floats and, and, and whatnot, and towels and whatever things like that they'll cover. So I got with Rhonda, and we figured up all the things that we had lost in our boat, and it came to around four, four to five hundred dollars, something like that. I said, wow, huh, if I got five hundred dollars there, I can play with. Because they'll cover up to a thousand, right? And all I got to do is put things on here that were lost, right? That's all I got to do. Was I tempted to do that? You bet I was. <laughs> you would be too. Especially knowing the insurance company is going to say, okay, well, you know your boat wasn't really worth what you think it was worth. <laughs> okay. You're probably going to go to hell for devaluing my boat like this. I don't have. Temptations like that come. And I could easily have done that. So with this storm coming in, anything of value, we are getting out of the boat. Being morally pure. The third way we display goodness is through graciousness. Second, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that when we're in Christ, we're a new creation. God has changed us. The gracious person is one who has a heart of compassion. He looks around, he sees others who are suffering, need for, uh, for help. And, 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 and when he can, he reaches out and he helps. And also, being good through graciousness you know, sometimes you're going to do good. You're going to show graciousness. You're going to do good things, good acts. And sometimes people aren't going to know you did them. And that's okay. You might not even get a thank you. But here's, here's the promise. When you're gracious, when you're good to others, one day... You're going to hear the voice of God himself. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's where your recognition will come in. And then finally, we express goodness through generosity. 1 John 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. So much love, we can't even receive it all. God is a giving God. He, he, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives some more. He just keeps giving. Even when we're not very good people, He gives and He gives and He gives. So in turn then, if we're to participate in the goodness of God, we should be generous as well. Shouldn't we give cheerfully? Shouldn't we give because God has given to us? Shouldn't we, we give just because we love to give to God? Being generous. Being generous. Not out of obligation, not out of guilt, but because it's the right thing to do. Church, I want to end with this. I want to end with this, okay? So all this stuff about goodness here. Um, goodness will never get us into heaven, okay? Goodness will never get us into heaven. We will never be good enough to get into heaven. You know what? Even, even some heathens can be good, right? Atheists, oh, they can be good. Bad people can be good. But just being a good person won't get you into heaven. Church, what gets you into heaven is knowing Jesus Christ. What gets you into heaven is being a child of God. What gets you into heaven is being a baptized believer. Yeah, we should be good. We should be good. We should be good people. People on the outside looking in should be able to see the goodness, the goodness living within us. 
because of who we are. Church, this morning, let me tell you, if you're not a Christian, you want to become a Christian, you can do that today. If you've got things on your heart and on your mind you need to confess or talk about, today's the day. And you know what? You don't have to come up front. You don't have to come up front. You can get with me afterwards if you want to talk, if there's something you need. Guest, we're your church. We're your church while you're down here. Keep our bulletin. Keep our bulletin. You got our names and phone numbers in there if you need anything from us while you're down here on vacation or, or whatever reason you're down here. We are here for you. And the reason we are is because, you know what? We're pretty good people. We're pretty good people. If there's anything that you need today, any way we can assist you, church, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and while we sing.